One regular comment on my Barbarossa videos is that Hitler should have just finished off the United Kingdom before attacking the Soviet Union. Now this might work out easily in Hearts of Iron, but in history there were some major problems. Namely that Hitler didn't anticipate the United Kingdom would continue to fight after the fall of France, thus the Wehrmacht wasn't prepared to fight the United Kingdom, and also that an amphibious invasion is not as easy as it sounds. So let's get started and look at some data and context. To make this a bit more interesting, we assume an ahistorical situation, namely that the Luftwaffe achieved one of the requirements of Operation Seelöwe, Sea Lion, air superiority over the Channel and South England. Yet we should not forget that air superiority is just a status and can change, and British aircraft production was quite high, nor does air superiority imply that there won't be the occasional operation by the RAF nor does air superiority provide a safeguard against bomber and coastal command attacks during the night. Additionally, the Luftwaffe would also need to spend a considerable amount of resources on maintaining air superiority and operational losses, those without enemy action, would also take their toll. But let's look at the sea, or namely the channel. Although it is rather small, it is quite a treacherous place. What do I mean by that? Well, during D-Day in 1944, the US and British forces suffered losses that were not due to enemy fire. Considering that they both had several recent experiences in amphibious landings like Dieppe, Sicily and various Pacific Islands, we can assume that they weren't particularly noobs. This is also indicated by the number of specialized and purpose-built crafts like the landing ship tank, landing craft tank, landing craft infantry, landing craft utility and many more. An amphibious operation is not as simple as it sounds, it requires a lot of planning, both on the tactical and logistical level. Additionally, the terrain must be suitable, the weather and especially the tides must be accounted for. Then the actual landing on the beach requires landing under fire and offloading men and equipment. After a beach is established, it needs to be secured to allow unloading of supplies. Yet meanwhile, the enemy would be mounting a counterattack. The enemy could use roads and railways, whereas the landing force would have to bring everything by ship. Or as Joseph Alexander, an assault amphibian officer from the US Marine Corps put it in his book Storm Landings, Momentum is the sense of any successful amphibious assault against a defended shoreline, but everything involved in delivering combat power ashore from the sea degrades momentum. Even under the best conditions, the amphibious commander faces a formidable challenge in stuffing his landing force into small craft and delivering them to the correct beach with sufficient momentum to attack a fortified enemy. But I already can hear some complaints fitting in. They refer to Operation Weserübung, the invasion of Norway and Denmark by the Wehrmacht in 1940. Well, first off, both Norway and Denmark were not at war. Second, they had no major navy, army nor air force. Third, they were taken by complete surprise. Fourth, one German division was basically trapped for two months in Narvik. And fifth, although the Germans won, the losses, especially for the Kriegsmarine, were pretty devastating. One heavy cruiser? two light cruisers, ten destroyers, one or two torpedo boats, at least four submarines, some sources note six, but I couldn't only account for the following U-boats, several auxiliary vessels and 21 transport ships. Additionally, both battleships were damaged and out of action for a while, as was the Panzerschiff Lützow. Which brings us to the next part, the overall situation between the Kriegsmarine and the Royal Navy. As a result of Operation Weserübung, in summer 1940, the German Navy had three cruisers and four destroyers operational. In contrast, the British had in their home borders five capital ships, one aircraft carrier, 11 cruisers and 80 destroyers. Well, and there were also another seven capital ships, two carriers, seven cruisers and 30 destroyers in the Mediterranean. Note the word operational and no, the Bismarck was not operational and several other major ships weren't neither. Now remember Operation Overlord, the US and Commonwealth forces invasion in Normandy took several years to prepare. Besides the US and UK being the leading naval powers at that time and also for quite some time before, they had at that point racked up quite a lot of experience. Besides that, they gained naval and air superiority close to supremacy. Yet they still suffered major losses like on Omaha Beach. And many goals like taking Zern early on couldn't be achieved. We should not forget that the German landing ships were mostly improvised craft, the Wehrmacht's lack of experience with amphibious operation and the serious lack of surface ships to support such an operation. 
It is in stark contrast to the Allied specialized landing craft, supported by naval and air superiority. Thus, it is very likely that the Germans would have suffered losses even without enemy attacks due to weather, the tide and accidents. Not to mention that there was a severe lack of transport capacity. The Navy could not meet the requirements of transport space by the Army and the Air Force for the flak. Now here is a very important point. Remember, naval strategy is build strategy, as one of my professors kept repeating. You can't just build battleships, cruisers or even destroyers in a few weeks. Especially not Germany, which had rather limited shipbuilding capacities. And even for smaller craft, the Germans were facing major problems. The procurement of sufficient shipping space and personnel proved to be extremely difficult in the view of the impact on the civil economy. The necessary reconstruction and procurement of materials, with the repercussions on the ongoing production programs, the demining of the channel, the laying out of own minefields and the protection of barge ports, massed ships and troops against British air raids. But what about the Luftwaffe? Well, of course, we assume that the Luftwaffe has air superiority over the Channel and South England. This, of course, would limit the possibilities of the Royal Navy against the invasion force. Yet we should not forget that not all Luftwaffe units were trained for anti-shipping operations. Additionally, the Royal Navy could afford losses, whereas the Kriegsmarine couldn't. But of course, why not just use Fallschirmjägers paratroopers? Well, first off, in 1940, the Germans had just one Fallschirmjäger division the 7. Flieger Division, and another air landing division, the 22. Infanterie Division, sometimes also called 22. Luftlande Division, which was mostly a regular infantry division with special training and equipment. Both of them were already used in 1940 and suffered losses. But for the sake of simplicity, let's look at some ideal numbers. The 7. Flieger Division in 1941, prior to the invasion of Crete, had around 11,000 men. This number is probably not so unlikely because they might would have been enforced for sea line. Note that this unit was elite and equipped with many automatic weapons, so they packed a lot of firepower. Then there was the 22 Infantry Division that had around 17,000 men, although some of its units were not capable of air landing, most notably the 2,700 man strong artillery regiment, which still had horse drawn artillery. Of course, during Operation Merkur in 1941, the invasion of Crete, the Germans also air-landed Gebirgsjäger mountain troops, so one could argue that more units could be landed by the Luftwaffe in England. Yet airdropped and air-landed units usually have major problems. For instance, they lack transport, and air-landing horses wasn't a really option back then. Also, major firepower like artillery was sparse in those units. After all, paratroopers and air-landed infantry are mostly light infantry, which can be very effective, yet usually lack heavy firepower. Of course, the British feared that the German paratroopers would see support intact and then use it to ship in panzers and more heavy equipment. One of the greatest fears in the early stages of the invasion scare was that the enemy would take a port by surprise and use it to land his panzers, for there were very few tanks in Britain to meet them. Hence, the Royal Navy job was to ensure that any port would be put out of action before it could be seized. Measures like sinking block ships, filling the harbor with coal, demolitions and setting piers afire. This is something often forgotten. A plan that assumes a passive enemy is not a plan. It's a daydream. Although occasionally they come true, yet I call this wishing, not planning in my book. Now let's look across the channel. Generally some people think that the Germans basically just needed a beachhead and then they would have won. Because the British Expeditionary Force lost most of its equipment in France and there was a serious lack of men and arms. Well, let's look at the numbers in July 1940. There were about 600,000 men in the infantry, although nearly 40% of them were in the home forces, which were basically armed civilians. The Royal Armoured Corps had 40,000 men and around 200 capable tanks, although the total number was around 950 tanks. And remember, the Germans also used quite a lot of training tanks. And the Royal Artillery had 350,000 men, although around 60% were serving in anti-aircraft duties in major cities. So although there were almost 1 million men, the problem was that there were very few capable units. General Montgomery's 3rd Division was one of the few effective units in Britain in June 1940, but had been building up before being sent to France. Now we can assume that the Germans would have at least to take London. And this is the main problem, since although many of the Royal Artillerymen were used in anti-aircraft duty, this also meant there was quite a large amount of AA guns available. Many of them in around London, and in case it was threatened, probably more units would be transferred from other cities. Then urban combat in a major city like London heavily favors the defender and turns it into a battle of attrition. 
Additionally, irregular troops and armed civilians would also have posed a far greater threat and problem in an urban environment. Since the Germans needed to transport every man and bullet across the channel, this easily could bring the advance to halt. And once resistance stiffens, the time played for the British, since their tanks, guns and planes could move directly to the front line, and the weather in fall and winter would heavily influence any shipping operations. Furthermore, landing in southern England and fighting is only one part, so let's look at logistics. So the scenario right now is that despite all previously mentioned challenges, the German army landed successfully and pushed inward. This is somewhat like the situation the US and Commonwealth forces were facing after D-Day. Yet the Allies put considerable effort into getting the logistics right from the very beginning, since they couldn't guarantee that an intact major port would be taken. They brought with them their own. The importance of Mulberry harbors goes far beyond the operational issue of efficiency they were. Until their invention it was axiomatic that invading armies would need to capture a major functioning port soon after the landing to replenish forces already ashore and to sustain the build-up. Yet even with the Mulberries, the Allies faced major logistical problems. What caused the Allied commanders and especially Eisenhower and his staff in August and September 1944 a great deal of headaches was the question of how the forces would be supplied in the future. But an argument is of course that the Allied force was far larger. Yet they also had a larger navy, naval superiority and fully motorized divisions and other aspects that the Germans didn't have in 1940. One major issue for the Allies was the lack of railway transport. Thus they used tracks to circumvent this problem. For instance with the Red Ball Express. Yet already at the end of August 1944 6000 vehicles were in use for providing supply without interruption. Nevertheless they were unable to replace the missing railway transport. Because breakdowns in the motor vehicles soon became regular due to intensive usage. So even if the Germans would manage to take a port intact, they still would have to either supply a serious number of trucks, which the Wehrmacht general lacked, or also capture a sufficient amount of trains, which was rather unlikely. But there's something else. Although the Royal Navy might be suppressed by the Luftwaffe, during the day, during the night, this isn't the case. Similarly, Coastal and Bomber Command could also attack the German occupied ports in England and France, and since the Kriegsmarine was low on ships, every ship lost or damaged would further strain logistics. Yet of course the Luftwaffe could provide air supply. The question is how much? Additionally, although the Luftwaffe had air superiority, this doesn't mean air supremacy. And like the Battle of Britain, fighter command probably would go for the most crucial targets first. And the major transport plane of the Luftwaffe was the Junkers 52, which was very slow and mainly unprotected. Note that the military version had one gunner. So it is very likely that the losses would increase over time and even without fighter command, operational losses and wear and tear would slowly decrease the number of planes. Furthermore, the series Deutsche Reich und der Zweite Weltkrieg mentioned in detail the problems the Kriegsmarine was facing in terms of transport and capacity and other elements. But there was no mention of air supply to circumvent or mitigate this fact. Additionally, for the Allies in 1944, there's a brief mention that only for one army air supply provided limited relief. This brings me to the final point. If an invasion would have happened, the Germans would have needed to build up enough power and endurance to deliver a killing blow, whereas the British just needed to hold out long enough to wear down the German troops or their logistics. The German main strengths were speed, surprise and initiative. These strengths would be inhibited or even nullified by the channel. Yet logistics, attritional warfare and naval capacities were German weaknesses that would be multiplied by the operational conditions. So I would say unless I missed something crucial that sea line could only have been successful if it would have had a major psychological impact that would have led the British or their politicians surrendering or agreeing to a ceasefire. To conclude, sea line is an interesting idea, yet there are several problems. First of your enemy will try to foil your plans. Second, attacking is always harder than defending. Third, with a proper endurance of force and supplies, an attack will likely not be sufficient for a killing blow. Well, I hope this clears up some questions, remarks and comments. And if you like what I do, consider supporting me on Patreon. Remember, every dollar helps. Special thanks to Justin here for providing me with feedback on the script. Now, if you ever wondered how effective German AA missiles were in World War II, check out this video. Or if you want some information on the current US Navy and Chinese Navy, check out this video. As always, sources in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.